Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, hope you had a safe commute here uh, this morning. Uh, we are going to get started. Uh, I'm Tom Clement, I'm with the Ag Fuse. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the speaker and then uh, I'll let uh, Chris uh, do his presentation. Uh, so today we have Chris Anderson from uh, F3 Wireless. So he's going to cover uh, 5G IoT. The race has started, that's the topic. Uh, Chris is the Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of F3 Engineering, which uh, specializes in remote device solutions from concept to manufacturing, from planning, proof of concepts to mass production and device development of wireless devices in medical and healthcare space. With that, I will turn it over to Chris. And 
everything gets more and more spectrum efficient. Um, for those who, who might not be familiar with uh, cell companies and, and, uh, and those spectrum issues, um, that spectrum is purchased uh, by, from the FCC. It's, it's a specific license to use a specific frequency in a specific location. And it is, it is a unique thing. There's, there, there's only one. So, for instance, uh, in a particular set of channels on band 5, uh, the, 900, uh, the 850 megahertz band, here in, in Minneapolis, there is only one license for that. And it's unique. Thus, it's really, really expensive. <laughs> uh, billions of dollars for spectrum. Spectrum you have is the more the more customers you can service and with higher speeds and all the rest of that. And the more efficient your radio system is, the more customers you can service with the same spectrum. And that is why there's 5G. 5G fundamentally is, is a collection of technologies um, that are around the idea of getting more users in the same spectrum in the same place, same physical place um, that LTE. That's, that is the incentive. Um, a quick note on the sunsetting stuff. Um, so uh, for those who, who aren't aware, um, AT&T is fully sunsetted on uh, 2G. It does still exist on AT&T towers in certain places because they decided to do that. That's rare. And if you go to, to AT&T today and say, I want to launch a 2G over product, they're going to say, why? And then, oh, no, please no. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, and the reason why is that spectrum, that 2G spectrum, the, the utilization of, of, uh, of the spectrum by the 2G signals is nowhere near as efficient as LTE. Um, there's also a lot of other really nice things that come with moving away from 2G GSM. Um, that have to do with implementing your piece of hardware. Um, 2G GSM radio had a maximum transfer power of 2 watts. Um, it's a narrow band radio, um, which means you have a high spe power spectral density. All of this means there are lots of ways to fail certification with the 2G GSM radio. Um, and some of, those, some of those ways just go away when you don't have a radio that has such high transfer power. And then why? Fundamentally, more people in the same spectrum. And it's all about spectrum efficient. Um, uh, oh, so finish up on that. So ATT is, is basically done, is my understanding. Um, and then um, Sprint and uh, uh, Sprint and Verizon are depreciating 1XRTT, which is their 2G technology, or 2.5G, depending on what you want to look at. Um, and uh, I've heard dates of like 2021, uh, 2021, 2022, for, for, for being, yeah. uh, for, for Verizon Sprint to be sunsetted on, on the 1XRTT stuff. Um, other side note on the 1XRTT um, uh, stuff, yeah, you can still get it today, but those modules are no, are no longer cost competitive. Um, you're going you're gonna to pay probably 25 or 30 bucks for something that goes 1X at this point. And one module, a lot less than that, like half, or maybe even less. So uh, they're, they're really, that's really not a valid path anymore. So um, yes, yeah, so that's the sensitive bit. Um, so what makes 5G 5G? Um, the fundamental source of 5Gness is uh, these bits on the top here. Multi-user MIMO. Um, Multi-user MIMO is uh, multiple in, multiple out. You have Transmitters, multiple receivers, uh, both on the handset and on the base station. Um, what multi user MIMO gets you is if I have four or eight transmitters on my base station, I can transmit, um, I can send one transmission on all of those antennas and actually be talking simultaneously to a pretty much arbitrary number of people at that same transmission. So sending data to a whole bunch of people all at once, and it's not just reliant on uh, uh, geographic diversity, location diversity. Um, uh, you 
you actually can, can service a lot more customers with the same spectrum. And in particular, this is important on the downlink because uh, now you can literally have eight people all streaming Netflix instead of two uh, with the same spectrum. Um, steered phase array antennas. Um, so I used to work for an antenna company, and we spent a lot of time running in circles around the phase arrays and phase the array antennas. Um, they absolutely have their place, um, but they're really expensive. Um, realistically, the vast majority of, of sub six gigahertz um, uh, 5G will be deployed with regular antennas, just because from a cost standpoint, that's what makes the most sense. Where the phase steered antennas really make it urban areas, and you, you want to steer bandwidth into particular areas, um, and you're doing that by, by, by tuning the antenna to point the beam physically one way or another. Um, uh, the, the typical application of phased arrays is, is historically been the radar, in particular airborne radars, because you don't want, you don't want the thing in the front of the plane to physically So that's really been the driving force that's allowed this to come into to, to play. The other place you run into the phase array stuff is with the millimeter wave, uh, millimeter wave products. Everybody wants to try new phase arrays for the millimeter wave products. Um, did I mention they're expensive? Um, so we're waiting to see how that all shakes out in the marketplace. But, uh, millimeter wave spectrum. AT&T and Verizon have spent billions of dollars licensing uh, millimeter wave spectrum. The, the key thing to remember about millimeter wave spectrum is it, it, it's like a flashlight. So I can shine my little laser pointer on that screen. It doesn't go through the screen. That's pretty much like how millimeter wave works. Um, it doesn't go through metal at all. It really doesn't like stone or any surface with water on it, things like that pretty much not going to get hardly any penetration. And that's the key issue you run into with, with deploying millimeter wave as part of 5G. If you're going to try and do this on a phone, millimeter wave becomes a, a, an in this room kind of thing, right? So, um, it, you know, so I can literally have my phone sitting here. If there was a, an access point up there, we'd have a connection. As soon as I walk out of the room, it's gone, right? There's no pretense of it going outside the room. Um, on the upside, that's potentially gigabits per second of the throughput um, for all of us, all at the same time. That's what um, and so uh, that's that's the upside in the handset context. Um, what I've actually been seeing is, is the first place consumers will see millimeter wave um, is probably going to be fixed wireless access. So basically, direct competition of the cable. Alternative high speed internet connection solution. The last one, small cells and DAS. Um, I was just talking about having a, a cell in this room that only serviced this room. That's, the, that's what the concept of small cells is. And, you know, it could be, if it's millimeter wave, it's just this room. If it's sub 6 gig or sub 7 gig, um, then you could have a small cell that covers this building or this end of this building. And a lot of that is fundamentally dictated by bandwidth requirements. Um, uh, you throw a whole bunch of students in, in a very dense area, and they're all trying to get at things at the same time. Uh, you know, there's probably a perfectly, perfectly viable Verizon tower covering this, covering this campus, but it's one tower pointing at this, this pointing in this direction with one set of antennas. Having the small cells uh, breaks up that uh, that bandwidth need so that you can get that on a piece of fiber somewhere and keep everybody cooking. The, the other piece of that, DAS. DAS stands for Distributed Antenna System. Um, so when you're, especially for sub six gig, if you wanna, you wanna cover um, a large facility or a, 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 a campus building that, that's, that's especially dense and stuff, you have this, this 
So it's this distributed antenna system solution, which is basically a piece of coax with holes cut in it um, that leaks. Uh, and you run that through the ceiling, and now you've got coverage uh, wherever you run that. Um, those are the primary technologies. None of those technologies need you to buy a new phone, though. So does, is there anything about 5G that's really millimeter wave? Like, couldn't they have taken 4G protocol, deployed it in millimeter spectrum, and then reap the benefits of the high speed? And is there really something with the protocol that's changed that made the millimeter wave in 5G? No. They, they, could have, they could have used the same OFDM modulation technology that, that is used for LTE on, on millimeter waves. That would have been fine. Um, the, the NR, the new radio modulation uh, type that is, that is part of 5G, uh, is, more, is yet more spectrally efficient than OFDM that was part of 4G. Um, it also has other repercussions that are somewhat painful from an electronic standpoint. Uh, there's this thing called peak average ratio for transmit power, and the peak average ratio for, for NR is, is more than OFDM, which means you need a, a you either need to be a more powerful power amplifier to get the same amount of transmit power, of RMS transmit power, or you have to do other fancy things um, like pre-distortion or, or other tricks to try and make to try and get that last couple of dB of transmit power out of your, out of your handset. Um, but at a basic level, it, it, this really isn't, 5G isn't about the uplink or, or the handset. 5G is about, about capacity for maximum users in a dense area. And so they're more interested in having that, those base stations be able to deliver massive amounts of data. And, so what if the base station power amplifier is ten grand? That's that's that gets paid for it. <laughs> it's amortized. Um, but yeah, it, there isn't anything that's automatically inherent of five G millimeter wave. It just kind of got rolled into one piece at the same time. Go. Cool. Yeah. Um, with respect to the millimeter wave, obviously it's going to be more affected by terrestrial interference, line of sight, you know, peak open penetration. It seems like for IoT. 5G has the advantage of a lot, you know, fat data, but it also comes with the cost of building penetration, so, and usability. Is there, is there experience kind of understanding that in the real world as far as, you know, its reliability in buildings and, you know, where there's trust interference? Yes. Um, so, uh, and, and there are special to, specialists at the major cell companies that have been playing with this for years. I actually worked with uh, some of the folks at at and when they were building their original test systems to figure out what's, what is the timing and the ranging that it looks like and how do we, how do we adjust the, the, the radio parameters to behave and all that sort of stuff. Um, you, you're kind of getting to the, kind of jumping to the end of the okay. presentation. Yeah, that's right. Um, because it's on your list. I'm just the actual answer to your question is millimeter wave doesn't really fit into IoT and machine to machine. Yeah. Okay. Um, other than it's a backhaul technology. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it's just because at a fundamental level, you almost never have direct line of sight from a thermostat sensor or a water sensor or a level meter on a truck or scales or any of that kind of stuff. And so that it does limit the application. Um, so well, to finish up on the 5 genus, um, so the idea is low latency, high speed, um, higher bandwidth per unit area, and higher connected device count per unit area. It's all about, the, from the carrier point of view, getting the absolute most out of that spectrum. And there's, there's a couple pieces in there that, that are, are good to know. If, you're, if you didn't have congestion issues on your phone, if you're in, in an uncongested area where the, the radio spectrum and the backhaul channel on the, back, on the, the base station are, are unhindered, um, you probably won't notice a huge difference in speed on your phone between LTE and 5G, um, unless you're doing the delivery thing, right? Um, so 
at a fundamental basis, how much speed you as one individual see, probably be about the same. Um, the big difference is from the network's point of view, from the carrier's point of view, that they can now give 10 times as many people that same speed as, as they could without the So that's pretty much where that comes from. Um, the, uh, yeah, so that's the, the nature of 5G is. Um, so, getting into like the more nitty gritty. Um, so, so yeah, 3G is still there, and you can, you can deploy 3G GSM products. They're they're out there. Um, they say, hey, Chris, go ahead. I, just a question on that 3G. It's, it's my understanding that AT and T will not allow any new activations on the 3G network. If it's just a 3 G radio. If it's 3G only? Yeah. yeah. If it's an LTE radio, they'll support the fallback to 3G. Gotcha. Um, but they won't allow you to walk in the door with a 3G only device and activate that. And I think that's been in policy now uh, since 2019. Okay. I yeah. I, I hadn't actually heard that bit because everything that we've been, we've been deploying has been LTE. Yeah. Right. And nobody does it anymore. Right. right. And, that, and that's pretty much the, the takeaway here is. While, while the 3G networks are, are still up and there and present, um, nobody deploys new 3G products. Um, the, the cell modules that you would do that with, uh, they're not obsolete. They're, they're still there and you, know, you can buy them new, but they're not the latest technology. And because of that, they're not, really not cost competitive with what is the latest technology, M1, um, and or even Catalog, frankly. Um, so, yeah, 3G not really a viable path. Um, LTE and in, so LTE has been the focus of carrier attention for many years. Um, LTE is based, everywhere that you're gonna have cell coverage is probably LTE by right now. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on the, uh, Hardware prices over the years, um, when LTE uh, cell modules first came out, they were actually pretty pricey. Um, that's been, been going down with refinement and market prices and stuff. Um, the, the key thing with LTE is if your phone works there, then if you're using Cat1 or higher LTE in your, in your device, then your device will work there. Um, that's particularly important in rural areas, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, M1 and MB1, uh, MB1 and MB2 uh, can, can be the cheapest cellular module that you can get your hands on, but uh, coverage is pretty much uh, very airless. Um, you would go talk to T-Mobile to start with and see what they are willing to, to commit to in terms of, oh yes, we've got coverage here, here, and here. Um, uh, in rural areas, not just know they're not there. Um, and that's also kind of an issue with M1. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, the key thing, though, is the M1 radios and the NB1, NB2 radios, that is the radio for the next decade. Um, there isn't some other technology that's, that's coming down the pipe that's going to be you know, oh, that just next thing, oh, this will be just a little bit cheaper or more, this will be half the price or you know, half, the, half the power consumption. Um, the, there was a pause where, where M to M uh, and IoT kind of, we all sort of held our breath for a while while we were waiting for LTE Cat 1 and M1 and M1 to, to really mature. And they're here now. And that's, that's an important distinction because there, there have been a lot of companies that have put off developing products because they were, they were like, hey, what's going on with all this sunsetting thing? I've never heard of that before. That's over now. The, 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 the chaos is settling in and has settled down, and there's good solutions out there today that, that, we, can, that we can develop products with. Um, LTE Cat 1, like I was just saying, uh, anyway, your phone works, uh, Cat 1 works. Um, M1 and MB2, uh, MB1 and MB2 um, require special uh, spectrum allocations. 
So they have to take a piece of the spectrum they were using for LTE or 3G and, and allocate it specifically for, for these technologies. Um, the, the key takeaway there is um, in rural areas, rural carriers don't have anywhere near the incentive to, to support M1 and M1 immediately that, that the MNOs do. Uh, Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint are all in on, on, on LTE. And if it's their towers, they'll, it supports what they say it supports. On the other hand, uh, if you get out the sticks a little bit, um, M1 can be pretty, pretty sparse from a coverage standpoint. Um, that will go away. My, my personal estimate is something on the order of about two years, 18 months to two years from now. Um, uh, you should see parity with regional, small regional carriers out in the middle of nowhere. This is, this is my personal prediction. Um, but it's not there today. Um, you, you can take an M1, an M1 radio module kit and go out west, uh, west of the cities here and, and your phone works and the M1 module doesn't. And that's because it's just not set up here yet. Um, if you're going to deploy something and it needs, it needs to be needs to have maximum coverage, um, and it needs to do this in six or nine months, then that's what Cat1 will get you. Uh, it'll be a little more expensive, not a lot, but it, it will, the hardware cost will be a little more. Um, but everywhere your phone works, it works. Um, and then my last note there, yeah, in urban areas, um, the MNOs have massive coverage, so you pretty much have them for a lot of the urban areas. Um, a little bit on the hardware landscape. Um, so a Apple bought Intel's chipset uh, line, for those who weren't aware, and that pretty much got rid of the only other competitor in Qualcomm uh, in terms of, of high-end chipsets. So if you're buying a fast radio, if you're buying a fast radio, it's probably going to have a Qualcomm chipset in it, uh, is the reality. If you're buying an LTE Cat1 radio, it's probably got to have a Qualcomm chipset in it. Um, on the other hand, once you get down to M1 and NB1, there's a number of new players, uh, Sequence, Altair, Nordic, and Ubox. These organizations have their own chips that do M1 and NB1. And that's a differentiator that I think what you'll see is those organizations will be able to, to really get Qualcomm run for the money because they're not Qualcomm. Qualcomm is, is great, fantastic technology, but it's a giant corporation, and they have to fund that. So um, I suspect what you will see is fast stuff will be Qualcomm, slower stuff, IoT stuff, machine to machine stuff. What we're concerned with is going to end up being a little bit of Qualcomm, but most of these other players. Um, the, the main takeaway is there's nothing left to wait for. Um, you can build. I, 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 an IoT product today, um, six to nine months is the fastest that you can realistically be able to develop a custom piece of hardware. Um, and there's caveats to that depending on what else is involved. But the, the fundamental thing is, all the technology is there today. What you build today will, will be able to work on the network five years from now and seven years from now. You don't have to worry about the whole 2G sunsetting thing. That's over. So, um, this last bit, the cost paradigms. Um, so, uh, cell mod. So, an M1 cell module. I've seen M1 cell modules into the thirteen to fifteen dollar range in small quantities. I've seen NB1 modules um, under ten dollars at, at at medium quantities. With those sorts of prices, now you can really really start looking at, at different business cases that it used to be, well, I can't put a $150 thing on my on my, uh, my tanker of uh, anhydrous uh, uh, fertilizer, fertilizer um, and then pay $35 a month for, for uh, cell service. Um, well, you don't have to anymore. Now that thing can be $50 and a dollar a month, or less than a dollar a month for cell service. <coughs> Um, that was pretty much it. Um, I think we're out of time, but I'd like to, anybody got any questions? Quick.
Go. I have one question. Um, it, it seems to me like you know, five G versus three G versus L one versus LTE. Have, have you seen people doing like a hybrid of you know doing LP WAN plus backhaul um, for like to cover an area more cost effectively? Kind of the combination of LP WAN plus. Oh sure, or yeah, or sure. Like it's actually pretty, fairly common if you have a high density of, of sensor type devices. It's fairly common to have a whole bunch of those devices, and then those could be LoRa, those could be BTLE, Zigbee, what have you, some local area network, and then you're going back to a gateway. And that gateway's uh, that gateway's still. One follow-up question in terms of you mentioned the economics. I mean, if you were to forecast kind of where you feel like the sweet spot is for you know relatively cost efficient. You think you know a TEM is the place to look for the low cost. I I, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, what is the well, what is the most cost efficient path? You know, all other technical things aside, to for IoT applications because the cost of the data is the most expensive. Sure. So, but it's something relatively low bandwidth. What's the cheap, What's the path? You should take? It's it's completely a business case about a business okay. case dependent. Um, what. What we do see is um, if you are deploying something, uh, if you're deploying something and you have the ability to put in infrastructure, then okay, you can kind of do whatever you want. One of the things we've seen in the medical space is uh, people trying to deploy a consumer medical device. And if you just say, I want to make that Wi-Fi, use the, use the, the homeowner's Wi-Fi, that doesn't yeah. really I guess I meant we didn't want the choices for wireless in terms of low-cost IoT devices and wireless specifically without land. What would you, you know, kind of steer towards like LTEM versus um, other technology? What's the most cost effective? So if so that comes down to if you have to deploy right away, cat one. If you if you have to if you're deploying within the next 18 to 24 months, M1. Okay. Um, I personally am not not a big proponent of, of NB1 at this point. I, I I think we're a couple years from having um, a, a, a similar level of commitment on NB1 that you see from NB1. Okay. Can you quantify what level of improvement we might get with 5G over LTE in terms of say latency or? Well. So that's actually one of those things that, that is highly variable. So depending on, on the details of your LTE connection, you could be having 10, 20 millisecond you know, round trip times, and that's not bad. Um, the idea with, with 5G is that you're supposed to have a millisecond or less. Um, and part of that is this whole idea of being able to do kind of real-time control over the set of the network. Um, uh, there are, there are going to be business cases for that, but they're not really going to be IoT business cases. At least not what, what we deal with. So, um, yeah, so some, some carriers are saying they have 5G available now even, right? Are they, are they actually providing one millisecond down trip? I haven't, I haven't measured it myself, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it, it, that, the latency thing is a very explicit part of the, the technology development, and it costs a lot of money. To make it to, to make it go that fast, so um, so yeah, I, I would be uh, I would be expecting that yeah, it probably does meet those requirements. What uh, new use cases do you envision with five G in healthcare? For example, uh, AR VR type applications or remote surgery, those type of applications. Uh, so I would look. I the what jumps to mind right away is. Um, diagnostic telepresence. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, instead of you having to go to uh, go to the hospital or the doctor's office to get um, uh, uh, an ultrasound, uh, an ultrasound scan, they just send you a box. And the box is connected by, by, by 5G. And they, there's a person on the screen, they say, do this you know, to look at the baby or to, to look at the heart or whatever. And you do it, and they can see this because of the low latency and the high bandwidth. They can see this in real time, and they say, no, stop, go back a little. Back and, and 
and do that really tight control loop interaction of no, like hold it there, tilt, tilt it a little bit. Oh, all right, yep. And then they take pictures and stuff, and they actually do that diagnostic. And uh, being able to do that sort of thing, uh, I, I could also see uh, similar situations for other di other di medical diagnostic type applications. Any anywhere where there's video or imaging involved is is going to be a, a big place for five G. Uh, start to see with 5G, I'd say the empowered edge, the rush to the edge, the edge computing. You've heard uh, AWS, Verizon did this press release about pushing edge computing into, I believe, what they're going to target is the base stations. How is your perception of the shift in the industry ecosystem from where the carriers were the, are now possibly just going to be the front end? and the cloud computing is going to come right up to the plan. Well, I think for IoT, what, you know, where we're going to see advantages on that sort of thing is local processing of heavy pieces of data and, and then not needing to push it back up to the, up to the, to the data lake. Right? So um, doing the vibration now. So um, it's super common on any kind of rotary machine to have um, a little accelerometer on there and you're, you're looking at the frequency spectrum of the vibrations. Looking at that frequency spectrum, you can tell very precisely when that machine is going to fail and why. Well, yeah, except you have to sit there and take all of that data and you have to have enough processing power locally to do the, the FOIA analysis to process that data and do something. Well, um, and then if, if you're doing that in an embedded device, you write that software once, and I, I'm looking for a specific thing, looking for a specific failure mode, and the output of that, that system is, did I get that failure mode or not? As opposed to just push all that data to the edge, to, to the cloud, the edge, the edge cloud, and now that, that actual sensor data is in there. And you can go back later and look at that data for things that you didn't know you wanted to look for. And you can go back and use that data for other things that you didn't think of when you deployed that piece of hardware. So instead of it being uh, an edge computer with a sensor talking to, to, the, to the cloud, it's a sensor talking to the cloud. And the edge computer is the cloud. So yeah, I, I would see that in, uh, in like I said, Vibration analysis, um, audio analysis, and data analysis. Any other questions? We'll wrap it up. If you want anyone to talk, just come find me.
Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of ways to get that data out that Right. Exactly. I mean, you, you essentially just get I'm like, like you just I'm push that handy and write that stuff out. We've got to try to stream it if possible. So you can do it. Yeah. 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 I watched it on many years back, maybe 10 years ago, they were going on your own devices. Yeah. Oh, okay. So not yet to mobile devices, but me. Oh, when you collect a Which at a low volume that might be feasible, but it just has to be in the profit. We sell pretty low volume for our artists. They brought us in for the they were having troubles with the CEO fence and triggering events. They weren't working correctly. They brought us in for the transaction. So I mean, well, training has been working for about 10 years. So we have dedicated teams that just push day in, day out. They're just consuming like what's sometimes in. They cycle in, like, so our people from Bulgaria. Yeah, You know, we're over there, they're over here all the time. And then they go all over on site. And they get sometimes three days to two ranks. So is it truly us who are for the customer? This populate the knowledge in this area. This is something that. And then we want to get the last of it just ramped up and basically get a lot of people. So that's what we're going to do. Very good.